to the Jazz Rants. I'm your alter dominant ego man. You can call me Mr. Ego if you like. And I'm sorry to report that the KH was out doing exercises on the deck here and he broke his little finger. Remember how I he had the bent finger? Well it finally broke off so he has no kaput on the, on the little finger. He couldn't be here this evening. He's trying to repair it. So I'm here to take over the channel as usual. Now, I want to tell you a special story when I was coming up through the years. I had an opportunity to play with the great Zoot Sims, the great saxophonist. Now back in those days, you know, Zoot was known as the big juicer. And when I played with him that particular night, he was hitting the juice pretty hard. And I was impressed because he was playing such great melodies and such great licks and great improvisation. And I said to him during the break, I said, Zoot, how is that you can so play so great when you're drunk? And he told me, he said, because I practice when I'm drunk. Now, I learned a lot from that lesson. And so therefore, I always had at least one or two martinis before I would practice and at least before I would do a concert. Now, I might not advise this to you, but it helped me out to loosen up the hips and so on, as it were to say, and it was able to do some of my great techniques, as I will show you now, the glide pen with great finesse, and the pentatonic plunge, and then the double whammy, and then the ultra dominant man chord cluster. There you have it now, these great techniques. Now I must continue. And I realize that most of you are waiting for the KH requests. And you've made many requests. He's had about maybe 50 or to 100 requests so far. And he's trying to get through them. And he's such a kind fellow, you know, he's sincerely trying to get through them. But my advice to you is, since I'm his alter ego, you should send me money. If you have a request, send me money and I will coach him. I will prompt him to do your special request. Now, I must say this. I, wait, hold on, wait now. Wait, 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 wait. Hello and welcome to the Jazz Ranch. I'm sorry about the alter dominant ego man. He's a little crazy. And I was exercising, but I didn't break my finger. It's still bent. But anyway, thank you for joining us. And this evening I have a special request from a subscriber for the song Sweet Lorraine. I'm going to play that for you and I'm going to talk about some of the techniques later on. So join me now with the song made popular by Nat King Call called Sweet Lorraine.
I had a request to talk about Sweet Lorraine, to play it and talk about it, so I'm going to address some of the issues about it. Now, first of all, I played an introduction based on a chord progression going from G to B flat, but I was doing it in a locked hands technique. And this is a song that was popular with Nat King Cole, so I used his technique to introduce the song, like uh, G to B flat, then A minor. So that's the kind of reduction. But I want to talk about the specific elements of this song that make it interesting or unique and also difficult to deal with. And that is that the fact that there's so many dominant sevenths happening here now. That's the special thing about this song. First of all, the first chord, of course, is G. We're playing in the key of G major now, which is one sharp, so it's like this key. So now it goes G, and the next chord is F7 sharp 11. So it, the melody is... So now this... That next chord is an F7 sharp 11 with the melody being there. It could have been like... It could have been like a... It could have been that, it could have been many things, but it's really an F-sharp, sharp 11, so it has that root 3rd, 7th, 9, sharp 11 to an E7 there. So you can see that the approach tone now, you could call it a tritone substitute, has the sharp 11, and it's going to a, a 6 chord, but it's in dominant form. So. So you have a lot of dominant chords in here, you know, which is different from most tunes. E7, then to the A minor. Now here's this approach to the E minor. So it's approaching the sixth chord, right? And then it goes down chromatically in dominant sevens, like E minor seven, E flat seven, D minor seven, and I, I use a D flat seven there. And I use a G, I use a C major seven there instead of a C7, dominant seven. I, I just like the C major. Like, so it's the four chord in, in its natural form, which is C. And then it goes to another three chord in dominant seventh. And then it goes to the six again in dominant, and then the, the two in dominant, and then the five in dominant. So there you have all these dominant chords that you have to deal with. Now that is unusual for a song to have so many dominant chords and also dominant seventh chords and also the fact that it's going around the cycle of fifths right like this like one six dominant two five and then into the relative minor and down chromatically and that could be a dominant chord if you want it uh, the four dominant then the three dominant then the six dominant, and then the two dominant, and then the five dominant. So a lot of dominant chords. Now you have to adapt your playing and your improvisation to those dominant sevenths. They're not minor sevenths, they're altered chords. That's the important thing to understand in the theory. Step two. Okay, I mix it up for the second half of the A section, then I get to the bridge, hit the one chord, now I go down the scale of the G chord, like this, in tenths, but I'm going G, C, B, A minor, G, and then I'm thinking I'm in the key of C now. I'm approaching the key of C, so I go right down the scale of C to the bridge. Now I'm in the key of C for the bridge, so I've gone to the four chord, or the tonal center of the four, of the four chord. So I'm, now I'm in C now for the bridge. So it goes C, dominant e, E7, which is dominant of the relative minor of C, and then it goes down in half steps like that to the four chord of C, F major seven. This is very common for like uh, standard tunes to have a bridge which goes into another key or is transposed into another key makes it very interesting. Four chord, now it's dominant. Now these are all dominant chords, which is the unique thing about this tune is now the four chord in C is dominant, down a half step to another dominant, and then down a half step to another dominant. 
to the D7 there. So now the D7 going down in half steps like that sets up the five of going back to G, which is unique, but it also has those dominant chords, which are difficult to improvise on because you have to take into account all their, uh, the scales of all those dominant chords. Each one is different. So I usually do like patterns in common, like, like that, or like, in other words, relate to the, uh, the dominant chord change. Like that's a good way to do it. Like, tr don't try to, to do too much with scales, just keep it melodic. Okay, next step. Now I'm using sort of a left hand, I'm using a technique of tenths, like this kind of thing, and a little bit of stride. So that's the technique I'm using, like this. These are tenths. Now they're broken tenths, but it's a good way to use your left hand. If you can do that. Now I know a lot of people say they can't play tenths. And I have a good left hand, but I have a bent finger on my... <laughs> I was doing exercises. It didn't break off. But anyway, uh, I can do these tents, whether I play them like that or whether I play them broken. You can do this, and you can get a great sound with tents. So, like, you want to try to do it to develop the technique of playing tents like that. One, five, ten, one, five, ten, one, five, ten. They really sound good like this. They really fill out the harmony, not only with the root, but the, but the third, and then you can put the seventh in the right hand. And then I use mostly a bass line approach. But I always try to put the tenth in there if I can. And it's a good way to do it. If, other than stride, you know, like stride would be like this. Which is also good, but the other technique is the tense. Now, you could do other things. You could do like, uh, those are, are like sort of Nat King Cole voicings like this, where you use our drop 10 voicings, locked hand voicings, you can do those. But the, to get great rhythm, those moving tense or the stride, gets a really good rhythm in the left hand. That's what you want to work up. So now, we'll go to the next thing. A couple things I wanted to talk about with this song is the use of the tritone substitute, which occurs actually right at the beginning. Instead of it going just to G and to E7, which would be a cycle of fifths, G to E to A minor to D would be a cycle of fifths. It has an approach tone. That is what the tritone substitute, the quality of it has in that, is that it approaches the chord like this. So now we get another chord in there with the melody note. Instead of it just being G to E7, now we have G, F7, sharp, 11. Now we have to adapt the tritone substitute to the melody note, so now it becomes a sharp 11. But what a tremendous interest that adds to the harmony. Now I can put a diminished chord there as approach. Now these are all tritone substitute. We could just do this. We could just do that. But now these all become tritone substitutes. Those chromatic approaches. Now I used one here, another tritone substitute. Then the D7. Now this is a turnaround. This is a 3-6. Two five. So I want to talk about the turnarounds too. Usually the turnarounds are a one six two five. That could be a a three. This is a three six two five. In other words, B minor E seven A minor D seven. It could be B flat. We can use the tritone substitute. So we could go B minor seven, B flat seven, A minor seven, A flat seven. 
So what the tri what the um, tritone substitutes is allow you to have a chromatic approach to the next chord like this, instead of it being E7 or a five, you know, a two five or a five one kind of approach. It's more like a chromatic approach from a half step above. So you have that option. So you can mix it up and make your arrangement sound more interesting by using the tritone substitute and varying how you do the turnarounds. For each arrangement I always try to expand it as I go through it. In other words, do different things on each 8 bar section. So I might start out like this. And on the second one I might go like I might embellish it or I might expand it like chordally or I might do something different or I might go up an octave like that always expands it and makes it bigger sounding so you're always trying to develop an arrangement so that it moves in a way that is like a conversation in which it it starts out like this and it builds, it expands, and it becomes more and more interesting as you go on through the arrangement. And that's the most important point. Now we'll wrap up. That's it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me at the Jazz Ranch for this rendition of Sweet Lorraine. I really appreciate your joining me and also appreciate your sending me comments. I will always respond to your comments and I will honor your request. So please write to me and you will hear from me. So until next time, I, in the words of my famous friend Hermie Dressel, God rest his merry soul, swing loose and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.